Okay, it's going. We're live on Facebook. So today I would like to welcome guest Meredith Pachi. She's a coach with Scooby Prep, which is a physique show um, prep preparation company, right? Yeah, so they do do a lot of uh, physique as far as like bodybuilding shows and things like that. Um, I think what the coaches, um, our team's pretty much known for as well with regard to just physique would be more hybrid hybrid coaching, which is now kind of termed uh, where we really incorporate the health side of things. And we look at that functional space as well. It's not just about dieting for shows and we don't just deal with competitors. Awesome. Okay. So pretty much the whole gamut of like all types of phases of life and stages of competition. Yeah, awesome. absolutely. Yeah. And then even phases for people who aren't competing, right? Um, I know for myself personally, I have definitely steered my coaching more towards, um, I always hate to say gen pop because my clients are athletes. Um, but I would say even more so towards clients who maybe aren't doing actual physique shows, but maybe they're dealing with like what we're going to talk about today, you know, hormonal dysfunction or maybe not dysfunction, but what actually should be happening within their life. Um, anything yeah. with like autoimmune, digestive health, things like that. Okay. So everybody, you're just an expert yeah. in hormones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yes. Um, I. It's funny, uh, you had mentioned expert, and I always kind of steer away from that. Um, mm -hmm. it's, and I think you probably, as a coach, you understand that too, is because yeah. I... I never, I feel like the word expert means that you've arrived to this place. And for me as a coach, and I'm sure yourself, I've never arrived. And I hope that I never arrive. I just want yes. to constantly be a student. Um, I think I learned early on in coaching, and I think we've all done this with everything in our lives, is you go in and you're like, okay, this is the way. But then some coaches kind of you know, stick to that model, but I think the ones that really shine are the ones that start seeing all the possibilities and all the avenues that things can go down and just start using it as tools to yep. start helping an even more diverse clientele. Yes. I don't and know that I've arrived yet. <laughs> okay. So you're not an expert. You're a passionate adventurer into hormone health. <laughs> yeah. I'm that lifelong, lifelong student. Lifelong student. Okay, I like that. And your journey started earlier than maybe you wanted it to with the ovarian contortions and all of that. So can you just give us like a brief overview of how you got into women's hormonal health and became like a lifelong learner of perimenopause and menopause? Yeah, so first off, I am female. So that would probably begin my journey. Um, I... I think that with most females and most coaches, it always kind of starts with our own health and our own health journey. Um, and we're not even really aware of that until perhaps maybe an event occurs or a reckoning where, you know, things aren't going as they should. And we're like, something is wrong or this doesn't make sense. And that kind of starts that deep dive. Um, and so to be brief on a, a pretty expansive history that I've had, um, I have been on the birth controls. And I say birth controls because I was on at least probably seven different types of birth control. Um, I did, was somebody that went, you know, year without having a cycle and I was fine with it. I mean, you know, <laughs> hey, who needs a period, right? That's what I was thinking. It was just more less to think about. Um, so I had, I have had that history in my life. And then things started changing for me where for myself, I started to get, I'm going to say abnormal pain. Um, and that abnormal pain started to increase um, substantially over time. And it definitely did take time because as we, as most people know, you don't really think about it. You're like, ah, you know, just once a month period cramps, things like that. But for myself, it really escalated um, to the point where like the pain would actually put me to my knees. So in, I'd be in a grocery store and all of a sudden I would just grab like almost like that pelvic region, like around my like uterus ovaries. And I would just, would, it felt like somebody had just literally stabbed me with like a serrated knife. I was like twisting it. So any females on here, they probably understand that description. They're like, yes, that's yes. me. Um, yes. And that led me to, you know, going to my physician. Um, I had had 
before that I had had abnormal pap smears. So I had also been down that route and I just knew things weren't right. And yeah. I went to my physician and I said, Hey, um, I haven't had a cycle in quite a long time and I'm having this, you know, pain and just things aren't right. Something just doesn't feel right. And, um, I had to, as what most females do, beg, beg, <laughs> borrow, cheat, no, actually, um, beg for any other diagnostic testing. And at that point, I was in my 20s, early 20s, and I had never had full lab work ever. Um, and I still had it, even with that. Um, but they did send me for ultrasounds. And um, during those ultrasounds, they did discover that I had um, two uh, larger masses, one on each ovary. So I had been diagnosed with polycystic ovarian disease um, or syndrome and younger. And we can kind of talk about that, which I don't even know if I truly had it. There's many different subcategories, but I never had a full diagnostic. So even to this day, um, that's kind of touch and go. But with these masses they found in my ovaries, um, they were completely benign, but they are called dermoids and they're types of cysts. Um, and so this kind of also led me down to my journey of looking at what are types of cysts and things like that. Um, I've had cyst rupture. Um, and then ultimately I started having what's called ovarian torsion. And so mm -hmm. ovarian torsion is where you have your ovaries, which are really small actually. Um, and essentially they twist around that ligament. Um, and for myself, um, it was only one side and that does require hospitalization. Um, cause obviously an organ is twisting on itself. And so there's blood supply and it does require surgery. Um, and unfortunately here again, during that time, what would be most diagnostic, which would be ultrasound to see if blood supply has been cut off all the ultrasounds came back that I was fine. Um, but luckily Ooh. I had a really great physician that was on call and said, Hey, to be thorough, we need to put you into surgery and see what, you know, what is happening. And if nothing's happening, then unfortunately we did a surgery or opened you up. And that was that. And I said, at this point, let's go. And sure enough, that was my first ovarian, full ovarian torsion. I had had partials since then, um, but just luckily the draw, they went in and I, I was in a full torsion. So they untwisted the ovary and the ligament. And, <laughs> and uh, that actually, what I would say would be like the trigger of the first for me. Um, because at that point, that led to multiple surgeries uh, down the line to where they would clean up my ovaries, meaning like remove all the cysts and um, actually cut into my ovary to make them smaller in hopes that that wouldn't happen again. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the masses actually grew back. And mm -hmm. so we had a, you know, a choice to make as far as quality of life. Quality of life for me as a female going into the hospital, because it did escalate, you know, once a month, for yeah. either a partial torsion to be there for like 14 hours in pain to be sent home because it resolved or yeah. to have a surgery. I couldn't live my life like that. So we had my first ovary removed uh, at that time and a big shift in my, I would say like psyche and just health just started to change after that, as well as I now understand that that's probably what would happen for a lot of females. Um, unfortunately, uh, which will kind of be the end of my little story there, but not the end of my journey would be my final remaining ovary, which I had never had any problems with actually went into a triple torsion. Um, so it went around itself three times. And at that point I had been on this journey for, I'm going to say far too long, but about probably like seven or so years. Yeah. And we knew how the song was going to go and one was enough. And so we had a meeting with my now surgeon who was in with me for so long. And we just said, I have no choice, but one choice. And it was the choice to dive into the unknown, which is be induced into a surgical menopause at 37, meaning having both of, or my last ovary removed, meaning I would wake up instantly being in menopause because I had no ovarian function because they didn't exist any longer. Um, and then knowing that in making that choice, 
really led me down a rabbit hole because because I'm in this coaching space and on this journey, I knew I needed to be supported hormonally. However, this also opened that other door of trying to navigate getting the hormonal support and what hormonal support I needed um, because there's so much out there. So you can kind of see like just different levels from being in my early 20s to my late 30s, you know, it just felt like 12, 15 year journey. That's like a huge, you know, amount of experience there that has just kind of led me to want to educate as well as advocate for women, Mm -hmm. which also means with that advocation and education, letting females know that they are not like another. Um, They are individual, like you are individual. We can make correlations and we can make some generalities yeah. But it really comes down to a really nuance of you as the individual and what you're comfortable with based mm-hmm. on your history and your present. So that's kind of like my journey in a nutshell. And I think why some people think I'm a little bit of an expert because I've had so many different things. Um, but it's just yeah. experience. Experience. Yeah. You've experienced it yourself. Yeah. So like going into the surgically induced menopause, what was the biggest shocker like for you that you didn't expect? Like you, so you skipped perimenopause, right? Yes. Yes. I would say like when I mentioned having my first ovary removed, I feel like during that time was probably the closest that I would experience (laughs) perimenopause because there, there was a huge shift. Like, um, so I was told and, and rightly so I was told by my physician that, you know, oh, your other, other ovary will pick up, you know, the slack. <laughs> well, understanding that with any surgery, even if you get a root canal, your body is going to adapt, right? Your yeah. body, your immune system is going to adapt. And with that, you're going to see some changes. And so during that time period, I saw major changes. It was a short, it was about a year and a half. I saw major changes with regard to um, my adrenal health my energy, my uh, brain function, if that makes sense, like clarity, um, all these things that people describe, um, I really saw shifts in it. So I would say my perimenopause was probably about a year and a half. And then I was like, menopause. (laughs) Right, like right into it. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So like, Generally, I kind of want to stay away from like the symptoms of these things because I feel like you can Google that anywhere, but it's more going to be like, what are the recommendations we can give people for how to like optimize their adventure or their journey through these phases? So you said energy, like that's a huge question that I've gotten lately is so like your estrogen and progesterone, they're declining. There's nothing you can really do about that, but how can you maintain like good energy levels or how have you maintained energy levels like through this? Yeah. I think that, you know, you are absolutely correct as far as like Googling (laughs) symptoms and things like that. But to touch on your point now, as well as that, I would say step one for any female, which could often be a little bit uh, of a barrier is getting to track your symptoms, beginning to track your cycle, because how do you know that there is shift or change if we have no really documentation? Because let's be real, like we can be like, well, was my period like that last month? What was it like that? Two weeks of, like, you don't really know, you know, like, I mean, I don't know what happened last week. No. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So that would be step one that I recommend anybody, any female, regardless of your age, um, is just start to track one, your cycle. So cycle day one, first day of your bleed until basically the next day of your bleed or the next time you bleed, that's a full cycle. So track, how long is that track? How long you actually bleed? That would be base level. You can get way more nuanced than that with regard to like cervical mucus, body temperature. But I think that that matters. Like that's some like pretty easy stuff to look at. And then start to notice if you have changes. Now, is this like the first time that you have uh, a cycle that lasts two weeks, freak out, run? No, 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 no. Just take the information in, look at what's happened in the last couple of months. Um, So many things can affect your cycle. But number one, track, right? So I think that that's like the biggest importance. And then, you know, going to what you said, I think prevention, there's so many things that we can do 
not to prevent hormonal decline, but to prevent perhaps the symptoms from being so awful, um, which one is going to be stress management. Two is actually going to be probably before stress management, but also with it is ensuring that you actually have hormonal function and you are having a monthly cycle, which is not just a bleed. If you are on birth control, you are not having a period, right? You're just having a um, breakthrough bleed or, you know, placebo bleed. But the more time you can spend in your life having hormones and ovulating, the better your perimenopause and menopause is going to be. And why is that? Because having that hormone production in your teens, 20s, early 30s, that is going to be setting you up for that brain health, bone health, that skin, all this coming into that perimenopause period. So Ooh. having as many hormone, um, as many uh, ovulatory cycles as possible, having great hormones, great digestion, because that's going to matter for your hormone production and excretion and detoxification, again, prior to perimenopause, having that stress management piece that I had mentioned, um, looking after um, reducing alcohol, reducing smoking, um, reducing inflammation, which goes back to digestive health, smoking, alcohol, getting movement in, um, making sure you're eating enough to fuel the activity that you are doing, make sure you're being active, right? Just, just walking. I love walking. It is amazing, but I truly believe in the power of strength training, mm -hmm. um, sleep hygiene. Again, that's going to go into inflammation, stress management, digestion, hormone function, all of these are going to set you up for that perimenopause, menopause time period. Okay. So two questions that come to mind right away is, are you ovulating when you're on the pill then or no, you skip no. that as well? Okay. Yeah. So if you're on a hormone, like a, um, an oral birth control or a hormonal IUD, then you are taking synthetic steroid hormones. So exogenous hormones, exogenous from the outside, not produced endogenously from the inside. And you're typically going to be on some sort of synthetic progestin, which is yeah. not the same as like a natural progesterone. And so okay. think about birth control is controlling pregnancy or birth, right? And yes. progesterone is pro gestation. So these are opposites. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is looking to get pregnant, we are wanting to make sure they have hormones. If we are mm -hmm. looking to not get pregnant, then they're looking to shut down those pathways, which would be hormonal mm -hmm. birth control. And that's why oh. even females who are, you know, if you're in your, at any age, whether you're in your twenties or thirties and you should be ovulating, if you are on a hormonal birth control, you are suppressing that. And so you are suppressing the benefits of those natural hormones because you're not ovulating. And then on the flip side, when you're perimenopausal or even in menopause, and you don't even know it because a lot of physicians will prescribe birth control to yes. suppress symptoms that we just kind of talked about how we can prevent a lot of them. Um, here again, you're not getting the benefits of, you know, a bioidentical or your own natural hormones. You're actually suppressing those. Um, one other thing I forgot to say as far as prevention, uh, and I just want to touch on would be HRT. And that okay. is something that I am on. I am on hormonal replacement therapy, which can look like many different things, depending on the female, there are pills, patches, sprays, um, little, uh, injections as far as like subcutane, sub, uh, sorry, uh, subcutaneously there's intramuscular, um, there's suppositories, but being on HRT, that is for anybody who is entering that perimenopause or menopause time period. It's something that I do suggest, but again, going to an HRT route, you have to make sure that you are 
having great digestion ahead of time that you yeah. here again are looking after the nutrition stress management, because if you just put hormone replacement therapy on top of a really bad situation, it could create a worse situation. So yeah, you can I just know. take this and it make everything better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's a really great one. I want to go down that too, but yeah. So getting off of birth control, like as early as you can, or even I've had a doctor recommend like doing six month cycles of off and on if like I really need it. No, that's terrible. Okay. <laughs> no, like, because think about what, what we're doing to our body. So confusing. We're, you're turning it. We're like on off, on off, like just kidding. Yes. Just kidding. Yes. Um, and so you're not getting those benefits of true actual flexibility within your hormones. You're essentially shutting things on and off, on and off. And you could be creating like quite the, the pickle of a situation depending on the person. Um, so like mm -hmm. this goes back into like, we are not the same. And this is where you'll hear a story of like Sally down the street was on birth control. She came off birth control. Everything was great and roses. And you'll hear about like Susan down to the left and she came off birth control and it was horrible. Like nothing happened and she couldn't get her hormones back. So everything really is individual, but recommendations for birth control need to be individual because there are probable situations where getting on a birth control may be needed for the quality of life of somebody. And that's something that here again, with my experience, I understand I would hope, though, that birth control is never the go-to for, I'm going to be put on birth control to control my acne. I'm going to be put on birth control because um, mood fluctuations, um, horrible periods. I would want birth control to be the last um, resort and really diving into with someone's health, making sure that they're shoring up all the things that we can do to yes. support better periods to, you know, if your period is horrible, let's look at digestive health. Let's look at stress management, your sleep, all these things matter to how bad or not bad your cycle could be. That being said, because I am in the realm of female health, I also know quality of life matters. And I do have clients where they are truly, and I don't mean the people that say I'm doing all the things, but they're not doing all the things consistently over months, yes. years, they're removing like, you know, things in their environment that could also, cause here again, endocrine disrupting, um, things within your environment can also be at place. So are you really doing all the things? Because I have clients that are really doing all the things and they their bodies are in so much pain that absolutely, if you cannot go to work, play with your kids, this may be the intervention you need. And so I'm never someone who is anti birth control. I am anti using something as a band aid. That yeah. is what I'm anti. And putting somebody like, for example, like yourself, you mentioned that putting somebody on any type of medication, whether it's HRT, um, and, you know, an SSRI for antidepressant, um, birth control, putting somebody on something and then not doing the follow-up as far as like, Hey, how's your digestive health? How's mm -hmm. your mental? How is your libido? Because all of these things will be affected by taking any type of exogenous medication, but especially things like, you know, acid reducers, um, antidepressants, um, birth control. And that's what really is important is doing the follow-up and also helping a client understand that this isn't a long-term fix, that this could affect their health later on down the road when they are in perimenopause and menopause, because we have stopped hormonal pr production earlier. Okay. So just to recap, oh, well, actually that leads me to one of the questions like for, from my clients is like, do doctors now, like, do they have the tools to diagnose like, or tell you, do you need birth control or not? Like, who do you go to for that? Cause like most doctors, they just say here, take the birth control, no matter, even if you're in perimenopause or no matter what, like. Yeah, you're so right on that. Um, it's really tough because I think that screening your doctor and understanding that when you go to a physician, that 
it's not just that you're going to them for their expertise, that you're going to them for a relationship and there's a trust that's involved. Um, and so I think that I know for myself, I had to do a lot of work and digging and find who worked well for me, who was open. Um, I was really blessed that my GYN was very honest. And he said to me that he typically puts women on birth control. Like he said, if you're in perimenopause and menopause, he's like, I put you on birth control. Like that is his modality. And I appreciate that because that was his honesty. And he said, you know, looking for HRT for you, we'd have to refer you if that's something, if that's what you want. Now, that being said, if that was said to me, I have the knowledge to say, yes, that is what I want. That is what I need. And most yeah. women, as you know, don't have that knowledge. If someone said, hey, you know, take this pill, it's going to make your symptoms go away and you'll never have to, uh, a period again. Oh, hell yeah. Everyone's going to be like, yeah. I am there. Um, <laughs> but for myself, I did have that foresight and that knowledge and experience to say, I need HRT because I know without ovaries or in my case, without ovaries, but females going into perimenopause, menopause, I know how important estrogen, progesterone and testosterone are for dementia, Alzheimer's, you know, insulin sensitivity, which yeah. again, this is why you hear about females going into these stages or phases and seasons of their life. And risk factors for cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, like does increase. And so I had the foresight to say, Hey, yeah, I'd like that referral. Thank you very much. But a lot of women don't. Um, yeah. So this is where I think you come in and I yes. come in and try to spread the word and say, Hey, listen, there is another choice there. There's another choice outside of birth control. However, let's talk about why you are considering birth control. Because like I said, I have clients that are on birth control and my job is not to take anybody off of their medication. My job yeah. is to provide education, support and empower them to make the choices that are right for them and their body. As we monitor looking at their lab work, as we monitor their feedback and how they're feeling, understanding, I can see the phases in life that they're going, um, that they're going down. So that being said, how would you know when, HRT is the right option or even a plausible option for you? Like, when do people need that? So I will say this. Most people think that you have to wait till you're symptomatic for HRT or you have to wait till you're post-menopausal. So post-menopausal meaning one year after your last menstrual cycle. I will caveat that. You cannot diagnose perimenopause or menopause by age. So mm -hmm. if I say one year after your last menstrual cycle, but I'm talking about a 20 year old, she is not yeah. menopausal. She's got amenorrhea. You know, if I'm talking about someone who's probably in their thirties, forties or fifties, if they're in their thirties and we haven't had a cycle, that's going to be a premature, you know, perimenopause, menopause, someone who's in there anywhere between 45 and 55 that's pretty typical. And so if someone has not had a cycle for one year after, you know, not having a cycle, then absolutely they can still have HRT, but it's going to be a different conversation for someone who is 20. So I normally suggest, I try to work with clients to go as natural as possible, as far as supporting with our lifestyle and our diet. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. But understanding that, our hormones will decline. Like that is, that is normal. Um, however, it's not optimal because of the health risks and changes in our immune function that come with it. So if you can start HRT prior to, or when you're just noticing the onset of symptoms, if you need it, and again, this is getting full lab work, because we can't just say, oh, well, she's having a hot flash. Let's give her HRT. We know nothing about why. Like, yeah. is this, you know, blood sugar related? Is where do her hormones stand? What does her digestive health stand? So I would say for anybody at any age, getting full lab work, assessing that, absolutely. I love Dutch tests for 
any of my females who are in their 30s, 40s, 50s, even younger, but especially if we're looking at HRT, it is something where if we've gotten lab work, we've gotten feedback, we're doing all the things, and I'm like, symptoms wise, we kind of know the direction that we're starting to take, and the symptoms are increasing, I say, hey, we're at a point where probably HRT looking at your labs is going to be the most beneficial for you. Let's get a Dutch test. Let's see how you're metabolizing these hormones prior to, so we can give this information to your physician. So your physician has this information for what, what type of hormones they're going to recommend you, because that also matters for the client. And that can be really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. So would you recommend like really dialing on in all of those lifestyle factors first before even considering HRT? Like, absolutely. Okay. Okay. That's what absolutely really across the board is Say it again. you need to make, yeah, like you have this, I think this is with any, any goal, but especially for hormones, if your digestive health is awful, putting hormones on top of that will be horrendous right? Yeah. We need to have good digestive health. We need to have good habits and foundations, consistency within our nutrition, quality of nutrition, because this all is going to matter. So if we don't have these things dialed in, just throwing hormones on top of it, it that's going to really be a really hard situation. So get these things um, in check first, make sure you're eating enough protein, you're drinking enough water, you're doing strength training, stress management, sleep, all the things we've mentioned, paramount. And yeah. then assess how you feel because perhaps your hormones, maybe you're not entering like the final stages of perimenopause. Maybe you're just extremely stressed out yes. because you're in this phase of life where, yeah. you know, kids are going to school or kids are going to college marriages, deaths in the family, you're, you know, having careers. So having that high stress response will also cause so many symptoms that are very similar to perimenopause. And it happens during that time frame. So yeah. maybe you don't need actual HRT yet. Maybe we just need better stress management skills. Yeah. And cortisol is a hormone. So it makes sense that it all interacts, like has a huge effect. So, okay. We know that metabolism. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sorry. We know that metabolism slows down like as we age. So is weight loss, like fat loss, truly hopeless, especially like a lot of women complain about the belly fat gain. They think they're doing everything or they say they're doing everything, but they're still gaining belly fat. Like, what do you say to that? Definitely not. So weight loss, fat loss. Well, let's say fat loss because we okay. don't want to just be um, we don't want the scale to drop and still be within the same body, right? Let's, let's yeah. be real. So let's say fat loss. Fat loss is not impossible as we age. Um, can it become more difficult? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, with regard to many different reasons. So one, looking at our hormones and then declining and how they might be affecting our thyroid. Going back to that cortisol piece, the so cortisol is essentially an anti-stress hormone. It's there to help us out during times of stress. So it's anti-inflammatory until it becomes inflammatory because it's being called on a little too much and everything's a little too intense. And so what can happen you know, during this time where we're seeing these changes with perhaps our stress response is we're also seeing changes in blood sugar as far as insulin resistance or insulin sensitivity. Yeah. And that's where I can see a lot of females because of that interrelationship with cortisol and blood sugar. This is where we can see a lot of that abdominal fat gain because a lot of our cortisol receptors are located in that abdominal area. Awesome. The, back, the majority yeah. of them are lucky us, yeah. lucky <laughs> us females. Um, and so during that time, when we are starting to see fluctuating hormones, fluctuating, declining hormones, that's going to be affecting our sensitivity to insulin and blood sugar. And then we're also going to be seeing more inflammation because of these changes with that sensitivity. And then we have the cortisol coming in. So it can be quite a storm. And then, you know, with regard to a lot of females, a lot of females are under eating. Um, they are under eating, and over exercising or just under eating or perhaps um, not eating enough, you know, micro 
dense nutrition. Um, this yeah. is where perhaps, you know, being strictly vegan or strictly this can be very disturbing for a lot of females because they're not getting all the amino acid profiles that they need. And with age, if it is somebody who is aging, we are losing digestive capacity with regard to breaking down of these proteins. Um, so it can end up being quite the pickle, but for the majority of females that I see, which is really interesting, even though like obesity is an epidemic, I'm actually seeing, you know, females that are putting on this abdominal mm -hmm. fat mass, but yet they are under eating and over exercising. Sure. And this is going straight back to that cortisol piece and that stress response piece. Yeah. It, it like, it's so counterintuitive. Like you eat less, you're going to lose weight. But I think so probably besides under eating, it's like under nourishing, like a lot of them are eating like granola bars and all this processed food. So they're, they maybe have enough calories, but like none of it is usable for their body. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, sure. you know, no, no, I was going to say like, and I mean, so yeah, like our body uses all the calories, but it's like what you, you know, what you uh, touched on there is so important is the micronutrient density. So when we are talking about thyroid function, adrenal health, these all require vitamins, minerals, like these minerals are spark plugs to enzymatic reactions yes. to the body. Yeah. Literally, it's like, yeah. you know, just electricity, just, ah, awesome. And this is where actually going back to like that, you know, vegan, um, or even like keto, like so many, keto. like I love plant-based diets and there is a time where we might need to cycle in different types of nutritional strategies, but when you're eating keto marshmallows or, you know, uh, the vegan peanut butter cups, and um, because it has, you know, infused with protein and it's like six grams of protein. Again, you have to look at the nutrient density, you know, the vitamins and minerals that you are getting that is fueling your body's function and the diversity. We all are guilty. Like I'll raise my hand up. I'm guilty of, I get on a kick of certain foods that I like and yeah. that these are the ones that for every reason, like they're single ingredient whole foods, but I will be honest, your girl needs to change up from her celery, cucumber, zucchini, carrots, tomatoes. Like I, I need to, I need to diversify, you know? So a few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And so this is what's important too, because that is also fueling our gut microbiome and, you know, changing that diversity, which goes back to that gut health piece that I mentioned. So it's like, you can't escape all this stuff. <laughs> I love it. No, it like, I love it when it comes full circle and it's like always back to the basics. It's just yeah. makes me, you happy. love it, but our clients don't always love it. Cause we're like, you know, we just keep preaching and like, you know, Hey, it's just these pretty basic concepts, um, yeah. which they're basic concepts, but they do get nuanced. Um, and yeah. it's these basic concepts that can be, be really challenging, um, because it can make, make a client feel, maybe feel a little bit restricted, especially this time of year during the holidays, because they feel that they failed if they had the cookie or, you know, whatnot. Mm -hmm. So this is where, yeah. again, that individual conversation, it really needs to happen. And I really try to approach all my clients from not a restriction standpoint, but perhaps restraint. And sometimes the win might be having the cookie with no guilt. And yeah. sometimes the win might be saying, you know, I'm okay with just one and I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And then the other time might be like, it doesn't make me feel good. And yeah. I know, you know what? I don't want it today. And to me, that imagine? is so powerful. Yes, exactly. Okay. And that, sorry, I got really excited. No, girl, let's go. I love it. <laughs> There's like a, a piece of psychological safety that your body, I think, has to have in order to let go of weight or let go of like energy. So like the restrictive mindset alone, I feel like can make people gain extra weight or just feel like they're trapped I hate to say this, but like trapped in a food prison. So yeah. even I think I like the way that precision nutrition, they like, they preach additive nutrition where you're always adding more veggies, more fruits, instead of saying, okay, don't eat the cookies at all. Just think about adding in the fruits and the veggies. By yeah. the time you get to the cookie, you're going to be like, I'm nourished. I'm satisfied. I'm good. And you can yeah. still have it. There's no restriction. Yeah. I always talk to something that I like to talk to my clients or I, I suggest to them is 
I always suggest them because it goes back to here again, blood sugar and all the things I tell them, you know, let's have no snacks. A snack is a meal that doesn't contain a protein. So perhaps, I love that. you know, perhaps we've filled our day with nutrient dense, single ingredient, whole foods as the priority. And we, at the end of the day, we want something sweet. Then there are clients that I actually, this week I said to them, I said, your goal is to program in a sweet treat for yourself every single day day because it's something that I saw that they were really struggling with. And I was like, okay, so as opposed, it's kind of like with training, you know, when someone has a movement fault, sometimes you lean into that fault and accentuate it and to improve it. And so with this, you know, the specific client, I saw her really struggling on staying away from those cravings of the sweet things. And we had gone into, like you said, the psychological, as far as like, are you bored are you emotional? Are you tired? Are you thirsty? Like all those little pieces. And then I said to her, I was like, so let's stop trying to not have it or just have it once a week and let's have it every single day. And let's see how that might change. Because if you know, it's going to be there, sometimes that novelty kind of wears off and you might not even want it after a while, or at least not want that. It could actually shift into something else. (laughs) Yeah. Like more nutrient dense. Yeah, exactly. I love the snack thing that you said where like a snack is something that doesn't have protein. So you can have as many meals as you want throughout the day, but just no snacks. I love that. Yeah. Because it also helps, you know, a client say, avoid the, um, the fear with food sometimes. And again, you and I both understand, and anyone who's listening to this needs to understand, this is very individual. (laughs) Um, But with clients, I think it's really important that when we have the ability to work on food relationships, and especially with females, understanding that most females have, don't know a time where they haven't dieted. I think that their relationship with themselves and relationship with food is a little bit skewed. And so working on that is super important. Preach. (laughs) Yeah. Yes. That is like the main thing that I coach is like learning to trust yourself with food again and not have any restriction. Like you are allowed to eat all the things. You just need to ask yourself, does this make me feel good? Or does this make, when we're talking about menopause, does this make my symptoms worse or make me feel terrible? Exactly. And that's where that conversation with, with regard to uh, like alcohol will come into play because it is hard uh, for a lot of females, but that is one thing that does not serve. Unfortunately, it just really doesn't serve. It typically makes those symptoms much worse. Um, And so here again, I think it's important to have the conversation of doesn't mean never, ever, ever again, alcohol, or does it mean that you know, the dosing of alcohol changes, which here again, I've had so many clients where I said, Hey, based on your symptoms, the best protocol here is going to be to eliminate the elephant in the room. (laughs) And I've had clients where it was, you know, quite a lot of pushback there. And then once they do, it's really interesting to see the shift because they're like, Oh, I feel so much better. And then, you know, they say, Hey, we're having this dinner this weekend. And and I'd like to have a glass of wine. I'm like, awesome, do it. And they have it. And they're like, I never want that again. I feel horrible, you know? Um, and so I just, I think it's nice when I see clients be able to make the shift for themselves and make the choice based on how it makes them feel and understand what the long term is and know that, you know what, like, maybe that means not having alcohol regularly, but come New Year's, you have that, you know, glass, you know, you toast the new year in and so be it. Um, but I never want a client to feel pressured to say yes to food or alcohol out of obligation for hurting someone's feelings or obligation that they don't want to be a problem at the party. Um, and so that's where I like to empower clients to say, you know what, saying no is a start and a finish of a sentence. Like you don't need a justification, you know, afterwards, just say, no, thank you. Um, And if somebody asks why, then maybe it's an opportunity for you to open up a dialogue about your journey, understanding you do not need to preach to anybody. Everyone's allowed to make their own decisions, 
but just yes. having a, a discussion and saying, Hey, I'm on this hormonal journey. Um, I've made a couple switches and they've really helped me. Maybe it could help you too. Yeah. And so just quick, briefly, sorry, but yeah, no. why, is, why is alcohol like such a terrible thing? I know that it impacts estrogen like quite a bit, but what's briefly, what's the mechanism behind that? Yeah. So typically alcohol is going to impair detoxification. It is, okay. I'm just the messenger here, guys. It is a toxin. Okay. <laughs> I didn't make that up. It really is, you know, a toxin for the body. So it's yeah. going to impair detoxification. And with regard to estrogen, it's going to increase histamine in the body, which histamine is a good thing to some degree. We, we should have histamine in the body. Um, histamine for a lot of people, you probably um, think about it more like allergies and that might be a good way to describe it. So histamine can be involved with allergies or am I, are we talking about alcohol being an allergic reaction? Absolutely not. Um, but that histamine of that inflammation, maybe a runny nose, um, you know, itchy, dry eyes, stuff like that. But with alcohol, it can increase histamine in the body, which histamine can also increase estrogen estrogen can increase histamine. And now we have a circle. And with that, that higher histamine, and especially in the evening can also impair sleep. Well, yeah. now we have impaired sleep. And so now we have impaired blood sugar, we have higher cortisol. Oh, shit. Now we're affecting blood sugar, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> belly fat. So it's becomes this kind of cycle. And obviously we're affecting with regard to hydration to our body, which mm -hmm. is important. So without getting too nuanced, I think that's kind of like the most simplistic way to say it. Um, yeah. So, yeah. It affects everything and then everything else affects everything else. And then it becomes a cycle. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's hard too, because it's where number one, like with regard to food and alcohol, I think that it's a really hard thing for a lot of well, anybody, because it's everywhere. It is yeah. on every street corner. Like how, if you have, you know, issues with regard to relationship with food, like there is food on every street corner that's fast and, you know, super shiny with, you know, edible and colorful, um, you know, alcohol is available at delivery now. It's at every social event. And so yeah. it can become pretty hard because nutrition and, you know, community and that's all involved together. And that's here again, where I think it's like that delicate balance of discussing um, every choice that we make, there is going to be a reaction with every decision. And we just need to make sure that those choices and decisions, number one, we own them. So I always talk to my clients that if we make a choice, there's no regrets. There's just a learning opportunity going forward. Um, yeah, exactly. So going into these events and be able to make choices that are best for you, I think is super important. And that goes back to with regard to like HRT, birth control, it's, there's so many things that are available to us. It doesn't mean that everything needs, we need to do everything right now, but we really need to not look for necessarily fast solutions, which can be really tough. Yeah. Well, and I feel like a lot of people have certain aspects of those things you mentioned, the basics dialed in, but like you said, it's not consistent. So it's really hard to know if it's working or not. Yeah. It's, that's the biggest thing is it hasn't really, we always talk about lifestyle change and a lot of people are in, in it for a 12 week change, but not a true lifestyle change. And there's more to that with regard to lifestyle. And I think that this is where I'm really thoughtful to females um, because you do have relationships with other people, whether it's friends or whether it's family. And this is where, you know, I'm not saying erase people from your life, but definitely doing an audit and really walking authentically into your power as a human, like this is to males and females, um, walking authentically to your power, even if it's against the grain. Yeah. Even if it's uncomfortable. Uh, and it, you know what, likely it will be very uncomfortable, <laughs> especially if it's the right move and it's the change, probably gonna be uncomfortable. Meaningful change always is. Yes. Yes. So I have a few questions from some of my clients and okay. One of them is how do we need to shift like timing of meals to facilitate facilitate weight loss during peri and menopause. And especially for those who have um, diabetic 
medication that they're now on or have been overweight their entire lives. Okay. So for the diabetic, diet, sorry, for the person with the question about who has diabetes, I'm going to defer and say that is going to be an individual conversation to that person with regard to their lifestyle as regard to what medication they're on. I don't know if this is like insulin dependent metformin. So I'm going to hear again, say divert to really make sure you talk to if your Liz is your coach, that needs to be an individual discussion for you. Um, I'm definitely going to say regardless for everybody that working on inflammation and insulin sensitivity is important. So looking at nutrient density is going to be huge. Um, looking at making sure our meals are balanced, that we're not having, I'm going to call them snacks. So just having like uh, yes. a granola bar or something, we want to make sure that we're balancing it out with like a protein, um, some fat in there. So some veggies, having some balanced yep. meals through the day. As far as timing, again, this is going to be super individual. So depending on if you're training or you're not training, um, what is the timing of your day? Are you on shift work? Or are you not on shift work? So for some females, um, this might mean that and for a lot of them, having a uh, starchy carbohydrate and perhaps some fruit in that last meal um, is going to help with sleep. Um, that mm -hmm. also could be a little bit of some people's pre-workout meal, depending if you're getting up at like 3 a.m., right? Um, yes. Otherwise, in the morning, here again, making sure that you're starting your day off with a substantial amount of good protein, one egg is not enough protein guys. Um, you know, one egg is just not going to do it. Uh, a bagel and one egg is not going to do it. We're going to need to add a second egg and probably some egg whites to that, um, or yeah. some other type of protein. Uh, I'll take the opportunity to say that there is no rules with what you can have, uh, morning, noon, or night. If you want to have steak for breakfast, if you want to have fish for breakfast, if you want to make, um, yes. like a brunch, yeah, have like a salad on the side and make your, you know, your eggs over like, you know, some toast or something. Make it fancy. If There's you want no, to rules. It. no yeah. rules. No rules. So I'm just yeah. going to say, make sure things are balanced. Understand that you are individual and that there is a lot of different strategies depending on the female and depending on the female's health history. Um, with regard to fasting, that comes up often. Um, mm -hmm. There is a time and a place for fasting. That being said, without speaking to one person, the general fasting rule that I suggest for most people is fasting when you go to bed and then breaking it when you wake up and have breakfast. Oh, I'm um, so happy you said that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's going to be the every person fast is. Yeah. And typically that's going to be about a 10 hour fast. Like if you're having, I normally suggest, and then again, this gets individual too, that most people have their last meal you know, an hour to two hours before bed. And the reason for that is here again, just for digestive purposes, some people do need to eat closer to bed. So individuality matters. But for the most people, I normally suggest maybe like an hour or two hours, just so we're not eating and just going to lay down. Yep. And then having that fasting window when you're sleeping, and then when you wake up, that is not the time for majority of females who are dealing with hormonal dysfunction. So if we are dealing with like, um, you know, amenorrhea, anything like that, fasting for long periods of time may not be the best recommendation. That being said, there are times that as a coach, depending on the person and depending on the immune situation, there could be periods where I actually bring in some sort of fasting but again, it's very specific. If we're having any type of hormonal dysfunction, adrenal, if we're having adrenal adaptation, fasting is going to be a, that type of fasting is going to be a stress on the body. Uh, going keto, that can be a tool. But again, is this a tool that somebody utilizes long term? Really doubtful, um, unless here again, it's an individual situation. Um, and then I would make sure that with anything like that, that is going to be more res restrictive. And what I would say is an advanced dietary intervention. There needs to be a lot of nutritional education. Yeah. Especially because 
coming out of that for most people that is not sustainable long term and this goes into that yo-yo dieting where people are looking for a quick fix yeah. and then they come out of that yo-yo diet and they go back to doing the same things that they were doing and they end up getting into quite the metabolic pickle um because they don't understand how to eat outside of that yeah it's almost like synonymous with the birth control thing like it's a quick fix and then once you get off of it it's like how do i do life again yeah so i like i do like you know for a lot of women working on metabolic flexibility for the majority of women i just find that fasting um in the technical sense of what most people understand fasting is is not the correct way to do it yeah. so i would just in this for this format, I'm going to say probably not the best, but in nuanced situations with instruction can be beneficial. Yeah. I'm actually really glad you touched on that. It's just, everything is just back to the basics. Like sometimes when someone asks me about keto, I'll be like, okay, are you doing this, this, this first, like sleep, yes. water, food first. And yes. then you have to earn your, <laughs> your well, advanced nutrition. <laughs> I asked, or a client asked, and this is actually a really great one because I think that I love red light therapy. So I had a client ask me about red light therapy and doing um, uh, cold dips. And this is also a client who's having a hard time meeting their steps every yeah. day. And so I was like, well, if we're having a heart, we're not, we're not training. We're not, we can't make it to the gym. We can't get our steps in for the day, but yet we can find the time to add in red light therapy and cryotherapy. Yeah. This is where here again, these things may be beneficial for, you know, an athlete. They may, you know, red light therapy may be beneficial for everybody, but unless you're doing the foundational work, it's just going to be another thing that you're adding on looking for a quick solution. And so because you don't have those foundations, you may not really be reaping the maximum benefits of that activity to begin with. So yeah, it can almost be more damaging in a way as far as like time and habits. And OK, so I have one more question and then we'll summarize and check out. But <laughs> <laughs> we've, I've, we've gone all over the place. So the last one is just how do you gain muscle during once you've entered perimenopause and beyond, like we know fat loss is not impossible. Is gaining muscle impossible? It is absolutely not impossible. So here again, making sure that you have inflammation, blood sugar and insulin, stress management under control. You're sleeping well, because here again, that's going to help with growth hormone, your weight training. Like females are so scared to weight train, to train cardiovascular health. You need to lift heavy and create a stimulus to your muscle. Lifting the same weight all the time is not going to do that for you and to challenge it. And here again, this isn't, you know, I'm not, I don't want to poo poo on anybody who's just going to the gym to have, to feel good. Like I love that for you. But if you are wanting to truly preserve and gain muscle, which is something we want to do, understanding that sarcopenia, losing muscle as we age is a thing, then yeah. strength training and eating enough stress management is going to be huge. And then, you know, basic things that are proven, like such as, you know, looking at creatine supplementation, very easy. Everybody should be taking creatine for even brain health. Um, and then also looking at your hormonal health, your digestive health, all of these things matter so much. And if you are in a position um, to begin HRT, yes, managing and optimizing your hormonal health, as long as you have your foundations in play, is yeah. going to be a great thing. Okay. So basics plus strength training. Like you really have to have the stimulus. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. You're likely not going to build muscle just doing like walking. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> likely. Okay. So just to recap, the I, let's narrow it down to the five basics that you can do to just to set yourself up for success, no matter your 20s or you're in your 80s, your 60s. Like what are the basics that everyone needs to be doing right now? Yeah. Have your nutrition optimized. So single ingredient, whole foods eating enough that fuels your activity and your lifestyle, 
strength training, hormonal health, starting from when you're first start menstruating straight through past menopause, digestive health, also super important. Um, stress resilience. So not that we're running away from stress, but that we're learning to be resilient towards it. Um, I think that those are some, some pretty big ones. Yeah. I would say those like probably come before everything else. And it's kind of hard because they all tie into each other too. So like the stress resilience yeah. is going to be easier if you're sleeping well and your digestive, it, yeah, all of it. Okay. So last thing, thank you so much for coming on today and just sharing all of, not all of your knowledge. We only dipped our toe in, but <laughs> where can people find you if they want to learn more or to hear more of your podcasts? Where can they find you? Yeah. So I am a co-host on the podcast Unnamed and Untamed, and we're on Spotify, Google, iTunes. And then I am on uh, Instagram and Facebook, Mayor Patchy underscore Scooby Prep. Um, and yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And anybody can reach out anytime. I love to answer questions and yeah, I can hope I can help and educate and empower uh, females out there. So if anybody is out there and this anything that myself or Liz has said resonates with you, then please reach out to us because I'm hoping by the end, everybody will understand that there is literally no time like the present to get started on your health journey. And it doesn't matter how old you are, whether you are in your twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, today is a great day to do that. Yes. Yep. And then make it consistent from here on yeah. out. Yes. yes. Once you're in, you're in. You're in. <laughs> yes. All right. 